Welcome, everyone. I'm going to talk about embolization, uh, current indications and techniques. So obviously, in a 10-minute talk, I can't shove every possible indication for embolization and every possible technique uh, to, to embolize stuff. So I'm going to try to do a brief overview and actually talk about sort of more emerging stuff that we find uh, interesting or, or potentially coming down the pike for us. So um, many different embolic materials. There's the old school gel foam, which has been around since probably the late uh, 70s, particles, which probably came around in the 80s, uh, coils and plugs, probably around the 80s as well, uh, liquid embolics, which have been around for a while as well. Um, and then the use really depends on you know how we use these, depending on what we're actually trying to do, whether it's the embolization of, say, a hypervascular tumor, um, uh, uh, prostate embolization, which has really been a big part of our growing practice, uh, fibroids, which has been there for a while, um, osteoarthritis, which I think is going to come, and I'll talk about a little bit about that, um, obesity, um, we were involved in one of the earliest uh, trials with that. Uh, bleeding, of course, sort of the classic bleeding and uh, AVM endoleaks and, uh, and aneurysms. Um, so a little bit of prostate artery embolization, you know, uh, BPH affects about 25% of men in their 50s, 33% in their 60s, and about half of men in their 80s suffer with some sort of lower, ur uh, lower urinary uh, symptoms. So TERP is still the gold standard therapy, but you'll be surprised at how many patients do not want a TERP if you actually describe the procedure to somebody You'd be like, you're crazy. You're never going to get 10, 10, in, 10 inches of me uh, with that thing. So uh, a lot of patients, you know, try to survive with medical therapy, sort of suffer through it, and eventually maybe come to some of these newer different types of therapies. So, you know, data, there's many, been some randomized control trials from the U.S., multi, uh, multinational studies that have shown that PAE is a good alternative to TERP. TERP is still considered the gold standard, but uh, it is a great alternative for patients who do not want a TERP. Um, and we've actually shown that you can still get a TERP later on if the PAE fails. Um, embolization is typically performed using particles. Uh, we started out using 200 to 400 micron particles in the first sort of RCT trial that we were involved. As we got better with it um, and more less, sorry, less concerned with sort of the complications that can arise from non-target embolization, we've moved to, to smaller sizes uh, of particles. And now actually we've, we've actually sort of moved to, towards using liquid embolic. Uh, this is sort of uh, a case, um, one of our first cases here, sort of on the left, you can see sort of this complex pelvic anatomy. Again, I'm not going to go through every branch of the, the artery, but um, we basically pick off the uh, prostatic artery and uh, we sort of embolize the, the prostate using particles. Um, here's one actually we did more recently where we used, uh, where we used glue. Sorry, I took the video with, with my iPhone here. You can just see the glue running away. Uh, the glue is done in, you know, we sort of mix the glue ourselves to get the different viscosities. So we, we have NVCA, which looks like, uh, if you ever did airplane models, it kind of looks like that same little airplane model glue. And you mix it with lapidol, which is basically linseed oil. And depending on how you mix it is basically how it's going to flow and how, um, how thin it is. So this is actually almost like 1 to like 15 or 1 to 16 dilution um, which is very, very thin. And so we basically were able to just sort of inject it. It sort of goes distal into the into the arteries and it plugs it up permanently. With the particles, what we've found is we end up with some issues of recanalization. So uh, we kind of like the idea of using glue. Um, moving on, so left gastric artery embolization. So again, obesity, again, in a room full of cardiologists or future cardiologists don't need to explain how, how much of a problem or pervasive of a problem this is in the United States and even outside of the U.S., um, again, we, we define morbid obesity, basically BMI greater than 40, um, and, and affects about 15 uh, million individuals. Um, so again, I, I'm not going to go too much into the sort of the pathophysiology of how this procedure works. Um, I think there may be a talk later on in sort of the main sessions uh, later. But basically, it's looking at this balance between ghrelin, and, so basically the, the hunger hormone, and some of these other hormones, and trying to figure out how if we can modulate that. And what they found... Um, is that if you most of it is regulated by this area in the fundus of the stomach, um, so it's sort of the same area where they do gastric banding or or, um, or the the, um, the bypass surgery, um, and so what they found is if you actually embolize this area, you can cause a down regulation in, in some of these hormones and, and actually affect their ability to eat. So it's not really just you're causing them a shit ton of abdominal pain, but you're actually causing their their hormones to down regulate and change um, by by embolizing that area of the stomach. So uh, again, this is a picture someone took uh, of us a while ago when we first came up with the, the original IDE study, probably now in 2013. Um, so it was originally a fi fi um, five to 15 patients. It actually ended up being about 20 patients, studied embospheres um, using 300 to 15, 500, sorry, 300 to 500 micron particles. Um, and we actually completed this study a while ago. Um, this is sort of what we looked at. Really, the primary endpoint was weight loss in 30-day um, adverse events. Um, and we looked at all these sort of secondary endpoints. The study was a pain because we had to bring them back, feed them ice cream, you know, measure their blood at different hours just to measure all these hormone levels. This is what you get for running a study with Hopkins because they get really down into the weeds. 
Um, so this is the study's actually the procedure itself is actually fairly fairly simple, right? So you're going to pick off the left gastric artery, which tends to be the first branch off the celiac artery. You can do it. Uh, we for the study we had to do it uh, femorally, but we were eventually able to do it radially. Again, it seems like a procedure that'd be very good for radial because they're all obviously morbidly obese. Um, so we pick off the left gastric. Um, we don't actually have to get super far into the left gastric, park a microcatheter and then embolize. So you can see the parenchymal phase. Um, what we did find was there was a lot of very, there was some variability to the flow in that area. So this is the left gastric artery in one of our patients. You can see there's a chunk of the, the fundus missing. And what we found is actually part of there's a sort of accessory, we call it lack of a better word, accessory uh, left gastric coming off the gastropoplutic, which actually happens relatively frequently. Um, and so we'd have to embolize that. So initially when we did this, we were doing trying to do spins so we can do on-table CT scans to figure out sort of the perfusion and anatomy. As we got better at it, this, we didn't have to do this. And you can sort of see the embolization. You don't obviously want to take the whole gastropoplutic, but we'll kind of park the catheter pretty far out and do it. So again, the 30-day primary endpoints were pretty good. So there are no major adverse events. Uh, weight loss at 30 days was about 4.7 kilos, uh, plus or minus 2.9 kilos. Um, and there was one minor adverse event, uh, which was admission for nausea and vomiting. It's actually funny, the guy went out and got a burrito right after the procedure. So uh, this is probably what led to that, not necessarily the procedure. Um, at one year, uh, you know, the weight loss was about still maintained, about 7.6 kilos. Um, excess body weight loss was about 11.5%. So again, this is not going to make them lose all of their weight. You still need patients who are going to be compliant with diet and and exercise and things like that. But I think it's a good alternative to potentially subjecting patients to gastric bypass. We have patients who are too sick. Um, or too fat for gastric bypass. And we're not really limited by that because we can do this with just local sedation or local uh, anesthetic. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is geniculate artery embolization for osteoarthritis is sort of relatively new for us. Um, again, um, pain and disability secondary to OA is, uh, again, very common, about 10 to 13% of adults in the U.S. greater than 60. Um, after failing conservative therapies, patients will typically advance to a severe osteoarthritis requiring a total knee arthroplasty, which is actually still in the U.S. the most common inpatient uh, surgery uh, for uh, for this age group, um, and about 3.4 million patients undergo this uh, will undergo this by 2030. Um, and several studies, actually most of them coming out of Japan originally, uh, but now we, we've had some studies in the U.S. and Europe as well, um, showing that this is actually a viable procedure for um, for this. And uh, this is actually a recent study that was actually published about a few months ago, done by a group down in D.C. and uh, North Carolina. They actually did a sham, a randomized sham study. So they enrolled about 21 patients. Um, seven got a sham where they actually brought them in, did the angio, and did not embolize them, and allowed them to cross over at one month. Um, and it's sort of just the schema of the study. And they basically looked at uh, what's called a WOMAC, which is basically their, their pain ability to, to walk, um, and then the, basically just the visual uh, acuity uh, pain score. Um, so the procedure is done you know, up and over. You can actually do it uh, ipsilateral as well, but basically you pick off the geniculate. And what you're seeing is this hyperemia in and around the joint. Usually you can localize, because the patients will have, you know, I have medium, uh, median sorry, medial compartment pain or lateral compartment pain, and you can sort of localize to which side. Sometimes it's bilateral and you can embolize. And, you, and they've shown even by x-rays that the, the, the progression of osteoarthritis actually stops. So it's basically hyperemia causes inflammation, which causes osteoarthritis, which causes more hyperemia and sort of this vicious loop. And so the idea is if you embolize it, it sort of cuts off the feedback loop. And again, this is sort of the, the couple of pictures from their study from the procedure. And again, there was a statistically significant decrease in pain. Almost all, actually all seven patients crossed back, crossed over to the treatment group. And you can see basically in their pain score and their Womax scores, basically they all got, uh, got better, um, even out to about uh, 13 months. So uh, again, I know it's really fast and a, and a lot of stuff to go over for embolization. There's a lot more that we do in embolization, but I think those are sort of the three uh, things that are more interesting to us that are relatively new. Uh, there are a lot of different devices for embolization. I uh, didn't even talk about coils and really get too much into glue. Uh, there's new indications for embolization, which are promising um, beyond just that. I think we're, you know, OA and actually in other areas, the people looking at shoulders, even facet, doing facet embolizations for osteoarthritis. Uh, we're starting to look at like neuro, uh, embolization for uh, GBM tumors in the brain as well. And there's actually new different types of materials coming, um, which I think will also open up new avenues for us. Um, thank you.